I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all creation, human or wild, vast or small, spiritual encounters that move us beyond words. Imagine a culture with no written history or literature in which traditions and stories depend for survival upon song poets. For the Hmong people, a song poet is one who keeps memory alive, who preserves the past and thereby ensures the future identity of a people. Kao Kalia Yang's father is a song poet. I remember asking my dad, why did you become a song poet? He said, when I was young, there were very few people to say beautiful things to me. My mother, with nine kids to feed, a garden hoe the size of a hand, took to the fields and the mountains. I used to go from the house of one neighbor to the next, collecting the beautiful things that people had to say to each other. By myself, I would whisper them to comfort my heart. One day, the words escaped on a sigh and a song was born. This is the story of how a little girl, the daughter of a song poet, lost her voice and many years later found it again, and how she has used that voice ever since to tell a wondrous story of her family and her people, a scattered people called the Hmong, who have often been silenced and whose stories have long been at risk of being lost. Kao Kalia Yang, an American, was born in Thailand in a refugee camp. Her parents, as just mentioned, were members of the Southeast Asian indigenous group known as the Hmong people, and they had fled with thousands of others from war-torn Laos. This was during the tragic time of genocide against the Hmong right after the Vietnam War. But let's jump briefly ahead in time to 1988 for our first scene. Kalia is seven years old. Her family is now living in St. Paul, Minnesota, newcomers to the United States, and they need to make a simple purchase. My father takes my mother and me to Kmart, and my mom doesn't know the word for light bulb. The counters are high, so she's standing on her tippy toes, and she says to the clerk, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. The clerk starts tapping on the counter because my mother has a thick accent. The faster the tapping, the harder it becomes for my mom. But she fights through. She says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. And she keeps pointing up to the light bulbs in the high ceiling. The clerk walks away from us, and my mama and I stand there waiting. There's a clock. It's a round clock. It's on the white wall. And 15 minutes pass before I look at my mother and I see her looking at her feet, and she knows that the clerk isn't coming back. And my dad had always said that my mom was the bravest person he knew because Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world. And he said, my mother used to walk even when old men and women were running away from the bombs. She'd just walk. But that day, my mother's head was bowed, and I knew that she was ashamed. She was ashamed because I had seen the whole thing. At that moment of her childhood, watching her mother's humiliation, Kalia resolved to stop speaking aloud in English. That was the day that I decided that I would become a selective mute, that I had stopped talking in English. I didn't have the vocabulary for it, but I decided that the world didn't need to hear from me if it wasn't going to listen to my mom and my dad. So the next day I stopped talking in school, and I wouldn't continue again until I went to college and learned how to whisper. Beyond whispering, Kalia says she did not speak English aloud until 20 years after the Kmart incident. Even in college, she only whispered. She did not break that silence until after she published her first book. And even then, as she stood up during the book launch event, Kalia tried to read aloud in English and struggled. When I tried to speak and the words wouldn't come, my dad got up from his place at the back of the room, walked toward me, put out his rough hands because he spent his life in America cutting into steel. And my dad said to me, if you speak... If the winds of humanity blow, then maybe our lives were not lost. So, yeah, 
started talking again slowly, hesitantly, on April 10, 2008, to be heard. But that story begins at Kmart in 1988. In this episode of Constant Wonder, we'll hear Kalkalia Yang's voice as she tells important episodes of her story and the story of her parents and that of her people. Since 2008, a number of her books have been published, both for adults and for children as well. We're going to touch on just a few stories from three of her family memoirs, which are titled The Late Homecomer, The Song Poet, and Where Rivers Part. We'll follow along from a small village in Laos, through war and trauma, across a dangerous river, then to unsafe refugee camps in Thailand, and eventually to a new home that is not quite home in Minnesota. Nestled for centuries in parts of Laos, Vietnam, southern China, and adjacent areas, the Hmong are a people without a nation-state, and until very recently they have indeed been without a written language, which went missing during an earlier wave of ethnic persecution. For the longest time, there was no written form. It was a spoken language. We believed that a long time ago, in the lowlands of China, we had a written language, but there was a cultural genocide. And so there was an effort to outlaw the language. The women and the girls embroidered it into our clothing to try to hold the language safe, generation after generation, and it's a language lost to the flowers, the designs in our clothing. A culture or society without permanent land to call home as a definable nation-state and without a written language is a society that teeters on the edge of extinction. So historically... Hmong identity had long been particularly vulnerable, and Kalia's ancestors lived perpetually on the brink. For centuries, they had subsisted peacefully and quietly in their forest homes. But when war came to Southeast Asia in the latter part of the 20th century, the Hmong were caught in the crossfire after they had allied themselves with a political entity that would turn out to be the losing side. So this is Laos. In 1975, the Vietnam War had been declared over. America withdrew its troops from the secret war in Laos. And Gao San Pathet Lao, the leading communist paper, declared genocide against the Hmong for having helped the Americans in the war. They said it is necessary to extirpate down to the root the Hmong minority. These big trucks started coming in and they said that they were going to take the men and boys, the remaining men and boys, because so many had died in the war, they were going to take them to become re-educated. So they gathered them up and took them away, and the women and the girls waited and waited. When there was no return, they went into the jungles looking, and they found them like fallen fruit, rotting away. So when these big trucks came from my mother and father's families, they ran into the jungles. They knew that they were going to get killed, and they, they fled on, on, you know, to family groups. There are dogs chasing them into the growth. Bi Yang and his future wife, Chu Moa, were preparing to flee. These two would later become Kalia's parents. Chu went to say a final goodbye at the grave of her father. So my mother's father, he had a big citrus orchard, and he loved his citrus orchard. He used to tell my mom and her siblings that when he dies, the citrus orchard would remain for them. And so when he died, they buried him in the backyard in the family orchard. They buried him in the customary moa way, which is to put a lot of river rocks on top in a heap, kind of like an igloo. And there are Facing the east, they had a tiny little door so that his spirit could enter and exit at will, meet the rise of the sun. My mother used to play there. My mother, who's been afraid of ghosts all of her life, the supernatural world. When she was born, she had a different name. Nobody knows what that name is anymore, but at the age of two, she was taken somewhere by a spirit. Her family couldn't find her. And then when they finally did, they said, how, how did, who took you, who took you? And she said, little cucumber. That was her older sister who had died before she was born. But she was never afraid of her father. She was never afraid of his burial ground. So as a kid, she used to go, she said, and play among the fallen petals of the citrus flowers. <laughs> 
She used to go and play underneath the overhang of its fruit, and she used to talk to her father all the time. And when they knew that the soldiers were coming, my mother, on the day that they were supposed to leave, to be packing and getting ready, she went to her father's grave and she talked to him. She said that the blossoms were abundant and the whole of the orchard smelled fresh and spicy and sweet. And she just lay there on that blanket of petals and had her last conversation with her father. It's like a memory that makes her smile even now, after all of these years. Oranges, the sight of oranges, the smell of them, the feel of them, they belong to her father. They belong to that moment in her childhood. Three years surviving in the jungle would pass by for the young Chu Moa and her brothers and her widowed mother before the young man Bi Yang came into her life in 1978. Here's how Kalia tells that story of her parents chancing upon each other on a jungle trail. My mom and her mother were out looking for cassava roots. My dad and his brother were trying to hunt wild game. And my mom said she noticed that he had no shoes on his feet, that his hair was like a boy's because it was so thick and it was sticking straight up and he was, he was just wearing rags. But then he smiled and she saw teeth that she thought were perfect. She said that they were gleaming and they were white. And this war that had taken so much, they hadn't taken the beauty of his smile. So he found out her name, that she was called Chu. And my dad, he started visiting her family group. At first, under the guise of visiting with her brothers. And so they started talking. My mom was a good listener. And my dad, who you know, grew up without a father. His father died when he was just two years old. And he was the youngest of nine. Not many people listened to my father, but my mother did. And so he would tell her all of these things that weighed on his heart, and she would listen. My mother said she didn't know it, but slowly her heart had gone tangled in his. He said, walk with me. Walk with me toward marriage. I have nothing to offer you but myself. My mother said that she could feel the wind blowing and she was swaying in different directions and that it was his hands that stilled her. Then she laughed and she said, because I was stupid, I was 16. I was stupid and so I walked with him. I walked away from my own mother, my family. I thought that there would be many, many more opportunities to visit. I was wrong. And they walked into marriage. He led her back to his family's camp. And so my grandma, because my grandpa had long been dead, she found a chicken and she swung it over their heads and she, she called them into marriage together on that very night. My mother was 16, my father was 19. They were in a war with no tomorrows, but they were young and they thought that their love could somehow keep them alive and keep them whole. For a few months, the newlyweds B and Chu could make occasional visits back and forth between their respective Yang and Moa clans, which were camped out in different parts of the jungle, with most of the time spent among the Yangs. Freedom to make these forays between camps came to an end with news of the impending roundups that were being led by two communist military groups and drawing ever closer, one North Vietnamese and the other Laotian. Chu was still just 16. My dad told my mom, we have to return to my family group. She didn't want to, but she didn't want to fight with her new husband in front of her family. And so she allowed him to pull her away. So at that very final meeting, my grandmother said no words. All of the words, whatever words there were, caught in her throat. The soldiers came in between. My father's family fled toward the banks of the Mekong River, in the refugee camps on Thailand. My mother's family went deeper into the mountains. And I think that is the most painful parting of my mother's life. And my mother has had many, many partings since. That is the nightmare and the dream that my mother wakes up from even now. On their way toward the Mekong River, B and his bride Chu and all the members of the Yang group were intercepted by the enemy soldiers. The men, who would have been killed if captured, quickly scattered into the thick forest. The women and children surrendered. Kalia's older sister, Dob, 
Chu and Bi's firstborn child was born in captivity during this time, while the new young father was still a fugitive in the forest. A month later, the women and children were rescued from the enemy and reunited with the men, and all continued onward toward the Mekong River that separated them from refuge and safety. In this episode of Constant Wonder, we are hearing from Kao Kalia Yang, a Hmong American. She's author of several books, including three memoirs about her family heritage, in which it's plain to see how Kalia has made it her life work to memorialize the suffering, survival, and hard-won triumphs of her people. Caught in the middle of the infamous secret war in Laos and its aftermath in the 1960s and 70s. I want to shine a spotlight on another incredible show from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. It's called Top of Mind, and it resonates in a big way with those who want to engage with the important tough issues facing our communities, but who are dismayed by polarizing and divisive approaches to these issues. Each week, Top of Mind tackles one tough topic. Award-winning host Julie Rose talks with guests about complex, challenging perspectives, and the Top of Mind experience doesn't aim at persuading you to change your mind. Instead, it opens a door for empathy and clarity in the interest of becoming better citizens and kinder neighbors. Listen to Top of Mind wherever you get your podcasts. We now return to Constant Wonder. So my mother and my aunts and my grandmother have been rescued by my father and my uncles from the enemy camp and they're beginning up the long track to the river. It's gonna take them 10 days, they hear. My mother's right breast gets infected, and that is the breast that the baby had been feeding predominantly from. So the baby becomes a sack of skin and bones, so hungry, unable to feed, uh, that the baby stops crying entirely. And this is a horrible thing because my mother knows that her baby could, could die. But she sees the other women in the group and she sees that sometimes when their babies cry really loudly, they ask themselves, should I give this baby a little bit of opium? Each of these mothers fleeing in the jungle were facing one desperate decision after another. A small amount of opium might still a crying infant who otherwise could betray the group to their pursuers, the perpetrators of this genocide put the baby to sleep. If the baby dies, then the baby dies. But if the baby doesn't die, then somehow we don't make any noise and we might survive. This is a situation that my mother knows will never be hers. Because even if her baby cries, she's decided, then she'll just die with the baby. If the group is afraid of getting captured, then she'll just stay with the baby. She'll die with her baby. She says in the time away from my father, she's learned that this baby will be her best friend. And wherever that friendship ends, it ends. So my mother has made this decision, but her breast is infected and the infection gets worse and worse. And my mother starts getting fevers and chills and she can no longer keep up with the group. My father's mother has one last can of sweetened condensed milk and she offers it to my parents for the baby. And of course, they're only too grateful but my father boils it in a pot that had the residue of chili pepper, so the baby starts diarrhea It's not helping. There are so many babies in the group. Every single adult has to have a child. So on top of his pack, my father's thrown one of my girl cousins. Big enough to talk, but not big enough to make the run through the terrain. On the banks of the Mekong River, as both uncle are blowing into these rafts, both of the rafts had holes in it. And so this one uncle, he says that somebody evil in the group has sabotaged the crossing, that they have purposely made a hole in his raft. And he's decided that the person who's done this is my father. And my dad says, if you're gonna say that I poked a hole in your raft because I don't love you, if you want one more person to die here on this, on this shore, then let it be me. So my uncle grabs his gun that my father stands up, puts the child he'd been carrying down, and he pulls at his shirt. There were only a few buttons left, but the buttons go scattering. And my uncle, he points the gun, and he's, his hand is on the trigger. 
But his wife runs in front of my father and she says, no, no, if you want to kill, kill me, kill me here. My grandma recovers herself and she runs in between them. She pulls the gun away. The most moving part for me though is that those buttons that had fallen from my father's shirt, that it was the little girl that he carried who picked it up. She offers those few buttons that are now useless, but she offers them to my, to my parents. And after that, everybody says, let's cross the river and the uncles with the broken rafts take their families across. But my grandmother, everybody says, cross, cross with us, mother. But she doesn't. She chooses to cross with my father and my mother, knowing that she herself, my grandma didn't swim, my mother couldn't swim. And of course, there was the baby, that sack of skin and bones that was no longer crying. So my dad, he decides that he's going to cut the trunks of the bamboo. He's going to tie it around my mother and my grandmother, and he's going to drag them across. And my mother, while my father is doing this, she digs a hole and she buries the photos of her mother, her brothers, herself from long ago, from before the war. And she tells herself that one day she's going to find those photos again. My father ties her, the baby, and my grandma. She puts the precious silver necklace that Hmong women wear as a sign of their womanhood in between her baby and herself. My grandma couldn't leave behind her precious shaman's tools, so she carries them as well, and they're heavy, so they pull at her. And my dad drags all three into the water. And I would ask my grandma many, many years later, why did you choose to cross with my dad and my mom? And my grandma would look at me and she would say, I didn't choose to cross with them. I chose to die with them. But though my mother lost her precious silver necklace, the whole family made it across. My father dragged them across the Mekong River. My mom said that she looked at my dad, his armpit, the skin was shredded like ribbons, flesh falling off, and she could just see where they had been because the bamboo had shredded his skin in the crossing. And my mom said that she thought her baby had died because the baby had stopped breathing. Her head had gone underneath the water. And she pulled her baby close and she started crying and crying, trying to breathe life into her child. She, she saw the baby's lids flutter. That's how she knew that she would somehow still be alive. So that's how my parents made it across the Mekong River is the primary geographic feature dividing Laos from Thailand. After arriving and crossing as political refugees, Kalia's family, in another daunting chapter of this saga, would be caught in long years of limbo in a camp. The little baby named Dob, who had barely survived the river crossing, well, she contracted polio in the camp. And as she grew, one leg ended up shorter than the other, making it very difficult for her to walk. This camp is the place where Kalia herself was born. I was the runt of all of the babies born on our side of the camp. Lots of babies were dying, and so my odds weren't very high. I had a cousin born very healthy, a male cousin, who was the biggest of the babies born in the camp. But my uncle, he didn't have clean scissors, so he cut the baby's umbilical cord with rusty scissors. And the baby got an infection and died. So somehow there I was, this tiny little thing with bird bones, and I was surviving. B and Chu at this point had two children, both girls. My mother was very tender toward my older sister because Doug, when she did learn how to walk, she walked with a limp. And all around the camp, people would say to their children, if Doug can do it, then how come you can't? She's handicapped, you know. And that was my older sister. I remember how whenever people would say things like that, I would turn to look at them, and she would pull me away, physically pull me away. She was wonderful. My older sister was wonderful and brave, and she made the world fun for me. Overwhelmed with refugees from wars on all of its borders, Thailand actually had adopted a policy of severely rationing food to Hmong and Laotian refugees. This was to encourage them to return to their homes, which of course was impossible. So my mother gave us whatever food she had. 
she would give us the food in her hands, the food in her mouth, because Hmong people were given food three days a week and expected to wait out the years. So after me, Marcus, my mother had six miscarriages. Every time my mom had a miscarriage, people would say she's dying. She's dying. There's too much blood lost. And I remember the water wagon, which my father would put my mother in and wheel her to the camp hospital as quickly as he could. I remember waking up in the arms of my different aunts, each of them trying to comfort me. I was always looking toward the doorway, waiting for the figure of my mother to come. And she did, despite all the fears that she wouldn't make it. My mother walked toward me on all of those dawns. And so I thought my mother was incredible. I remember my mother spending long days sewing like so many Hmong women did. If you were good at it and you made embroidery, and if you had people who you knew overseas and you mailed it to them and if they could sell it, then maybe they could mail it, send back a little bit of money and you'd have a little bit more to survive on for shampoo and toothbrush and clothing, shoes, all the other essentials. I knew that life was hard, but I also knew that I was incredibly loved, that I had an incredible big sister who was tremendously brave and a mother who, who kept living. Even though death was chasing her hard, my mother kept on living. Kalia has said that when she was a small child, she thought that the very definition of being Hmong was to be surrounded and confined by people with guns. The thing about the camp, Marcus, was that there were people with guns, but the guns were always pointed inward. They were not pointed outward. So there was a lot to be afraid of. I remember asking my dad one day, asking him, Daddy, is all of the world a refugee camp? Because I could see other people coming, but we couldn't leave. And I had no way of envisioning a world beyond the fence. And my father, because he's a song poet, because he has a poet's heart, he had my mother dress me in my finest clothing, and he changed into his best clothing, and my older sister too. He took us to the tallest tree on our side of the camp. He climbed that tree and he held us in his arms so that we could see beyond the fences of our world. He lifted us in his arms and he said, look, pointed to the horizon and said, one day your feet will walk on the horizons your father has ever seen. Kalia was six years old when the camps were shut down and her family was granted asylum in the United States. It would have been impossible for Bi Yang, his wife Chu, and their young children to imagine a horizon we call Minnesota. And arriving at a new horizon, as becomes clear in most every immigrant story, is just the beginning of another chapter of struggle. Of course, the family landed in a much safer place and a place of great promise and socioeconomic opportunity, but when Kalia's family got to Minnesota, life remained hard. For many years, her parents rose in the wee hours of the morning, even in the frigid winters, bundled all the children up, dropped them off at a cousin's house, and then went to work in factories. Necessities were sparse, luxuries unheard of. And as we have seen, basic civil respect was not to be expected. But when she was eight, not long after the attempt to purchase new light bulbs, Kalia had another transformative experience, this one as empowering as the other had been mortifying. It would utterly change her sense of who her father really was. This was in November of 1989, and the setting was the annual Hmong New Year's celebration in St. Paul, Minnesota, a massive event in the city's old civic center with exhibits, vendor booths, traditional food and clothing, singing, dancing. The Hmong New Year attracts 30,000, 40,000 Hmong Americans from around the country and around the world. So it's a huge gathering of people. And there's a big old stage, and you go up on that stage, and your voice rings out across this arena. The young people are tossing balls and maybe more interested in each other than any song. But a lot of the elders stop, and they look, and they hear, and they absorb it. As a kid, I used to just run around playing tag among all of these bodies, and suddenly my father's name is being called. And at first, I stare all around trying to find the Bi Yang that they're asking for, but everybody's looking at my dad, and people are beginning to pull him toward the stage. He is reluctant, but my father 
slowly walks up because the hands continue to push and pull. My dad is a humble man. He doesn't like attention per se, and he doesn't chase it. But it is almost as if something else comes into play. He becomes a different version of himself. His voice is steady and it is strong. He's not afraid to chase the lyrics. He's not afraid to chase the songs, the melodies inside of him. And on the stage for the very first time in my life, I hear my father singing and I actually hear the words and I actually understand. To me, it's striking how little time had actually elapsed between B taking his two daughters to the top of a tree to imagine an unimaginable horizon and now this scene playing out a world far away. Young Kalia participating in this celebration, experiencing a radically different definition of what it means to be Hmong. She's still, of course, a selective mute, silent among speakers of English, but not here and not now in a place of great solidarity. And suddenly, for the first time in any public setting and unexpectedly, she hears her father singing stories and memories about her people in a vast, colorful, festive gathering of thousands. My father sang traditional song poetry all the time, to himself, to me, to my sister, to, to our mother. Once in a while, as a kid, I'd hear, oh, your father sang at this gathering or that gathering. And I heard recordings. People would record my father on old cassette recorders whenever he sang. So I knew that my father was a song poet, but right up until that moment, I did not see it as an art. I did not see it as something bigger than just him singing to me. Dad was singing a song about the war, the war in Laos, the war that tore brothers and sisters apart, that sent one across a wide ocean and that kept one captive in a world that would never be the same again. He's talking about how they might never meet again in this life, but how when the time comes, when they shed their earthly bodies, how they might be united again in the same nest as, as eggs from the same parent, birds of the same song. And I look around me, and all of these people, all of these adults, my mother included, they're all crying. And my dad stands up there. Tears don't fall from his eyes, but they leak from his voice. And inside my heart, there's like a bursting. And I know for the very first time that my father isn't just mine, that he belongs to the Hmong people. Bi Yang's song poetry carried weighty meanings for a people lacking many of the usual undergirdings of culture, things like a written history or a traditional literature, the status of a political nation-state, and because so many of them had been dispersed by force around the world, something as basic as geographic proximity to each other. My father's poetry, it is so much a document of Hmong history and these shared experiences that belong to the whole of who we are, as much as they're very individual. And that day I heard him. I heard the heartbreak. I heard the historical context of my own life. But I also heard some vision of a future far beyond the one I inhabited. <laughs> After her dad's impromptu performance at the Hmong New Year's celebration, the family phone began ringing incessantly. The phone would ring and my mom would pick up and it was a stranger and they said, I'd, I've been there, I heard your husband sing and I recognize his voice because there had been a recording in the camps and somehow I got my hands on it and I never knew who the person was, but I heard your husband Please, please have him record a song for me or two. Calls came from the Hmong community in Laos and in Australia and in France. People were saying, sing, sing for us. And finally, my dad says, fine, let's do it. So every year around Independence Day, July 4th, there's a big soccer tournament in St. Paul, Minnesota. It is the biggest summer festival in the Hmong community. And so my parents rented a little booth, and so my mother sold the cassette tapes. They made a profit of 
$5,000. And for the first time in our lives, my sister and I knew that our parents had money. There had been talk of B recording a second album, but that never happened. The seed corn, as it were, was quickly eaten by a hungry family. And so that $5,000, which they had initially talked about making into a second album, never came out. It translated into all the things we needed and wanted. The rice in our bowls, the chicken drumsticks in our hands. And the second album didn't come out. You know, when I went back to my father's album and I listened to it as an adult, I could hear first love. I could hear laughter and humor. I could hear a different way of life, ways of comforting, but also just cajoling each other in in my father's art. You know, there are songs about, yes, being an orphan, yearning for a father, living to be one. There's, but there's also songs of mothers and fathers gathered around the same earth, drinking from the same kettle, the same cups. Just incredible songs of family and community being together. Traditional Hmong spiritual beliefs entail an otherworldly perspective on life and death, including a notion that babies waiting to be born live in the sky and are aware of their future homes on earth. It's a belief that affords a sense of continuity and a willingness to be open to the idea that existence for the soul or spirit of a family member or ancestor or descendant, a friend or a stranger, isn't limited to the world we can see or detect with our physical senses. Not only does something come before, but something also comes after. My mother has seven living children and seven dead ones. All miscarriages, big enough so the adults knew they were boys, but not big enough to join us in life. And I've always, I've always felt their presence. I come from a culture where the world that we know, the world that we can touch, the world that we can smell, isn't the only world that exists. My grandma, she took a fall in early 2003. And when I went to her and I said, Grandma, get up, she looked at me and she said, May I? Your grandma's not getting up again. And I said, why not? And she said, because there were people who loved me before you. Before you, I had a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, your grandpa, my most precious baby girl. She said, while there is no Hmong land in the map of a bigger world, I'm going to climb this Hmong mountain that lives in my heart. I'm going to swing open the door to the house of my youth. Dinner will be ready. Everybody will be there. And they will all say, why are you so late in coming home? It would be selfish of you to cry for me to stay. It's my time to go. That was our goodbye. That was her goodbye to me. Kalia here is referring to the grandmother she knew personally and who came with a family to Minnesota, her paternal grandmother. You'll recall that Kalia never met her maternal grandmother, who stayed in Laos when her family fled through the forest toward the Mekong River. For years, Kalia's family was nonetheless able to stay in touch with this grandma by way of cassette tape exchanges sent back and forth. Messages were taped, sent, recorded over and sent back, over and over again. We would expect this in a culture relying on oral communication instead of written letters. So we are a predominantly oral tradition When the war happened and the Hmong were dispersed all over the world, we took to sending tapes. I have one grandma in my life, my father's mother, and she's a strong, powerful figure. And I didn't know how or when I would need this other grandma who I'd never seen before, who on the photographs that my mother shares with me, I kind of look like. I don't have her long neck, but I have her jawbone. And so... As a child, I would listen to these scratchy tapes of her saying, Menai, this is your grandma. I'm your mother's mother. We've never met, but I love you. I didn't know how to return that love. Eventually, I would become a mother. And on the day that I heard my mother call out for my daughter, I can tell you my heart. I knew what was missing from my life all of these years. When my mother said to my daughter, Menai, I'm your nitai. I'm so happy to meet you, Mei Shengyang. Kuhluko, I love you. 
wasn't until that moment that I knew that I had somehow lived without that love on my side, that I didn't know what to make of it. So these scratchy tapes from long ago, they're incredibly valuable. They are a record of somebody who I've never met who loved me anyway, who loved me across an ocean, across time itself. And I know because I am a Hmong daughter that one day when I returned to that Hmong house, talked into the mountain within my heart, I would know that voice calling for me. Kalia's memoir, focusing primarily on the figure of her father, titled The Song Poet, was published in 2016. In 2023, his story made the leap from Kalia's written page to the stage of the Minnesota Opera. is writing a book about me. She believes it will help the world see men like me more clearly. She's writing about my soul. And we watch the story of the song poet come to life. And as my dad is watching it, I can see both my mama and my dad, tears are just coming out of my eyes. And my kids are, are looking at their grandpa and their grandma, and they're looking at the people on stage singing these songs. My kids afterward, I said, what do you, what do you think? It was their very first opera, and they said, it's incredible. It's incredible. And I said, that's your grandpa's story. That's your grandma's story. That's your family's story. And they all, all three of them, said to me, and it is also our story. There are Hmong people all over the world. There are Hmong Australian, there are Hmong France, there are Hmong everything. My children are Hmong Americans. And I think there's a great deal to be proud of. There's a great deal of magic. And there's a great deal of power in the stories that they come from. And I feel so grateful that I can add this chapter to the American story. Thank you for listening to Constant Wonder. Our guest has been Kao Kalia Yang, author of many books. Most germane to what we've heard in this episode are her three memoirs, The Late Homecomer, The Song Poet, and Where Rivers Part. Today's episode was produced by Eric Scholzka with help from Lydia McElroy and sound design by Josh Fouts. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. There's another podcast you might like from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. It's called In Good Faith. Stephen Cap Perry is the host. He visits with people of various faith traditions. These guests are generous and compassionate and share in their own words firsthand experiences of their faith, hope, and belief. It's a chance to deepen our collective understanding of what it's like to live a spiritual life. And by the way, Stephen has a global perspective. He has cultivated that over a lifetime of travel, and that enlivens every conversation he has. In good faith, an inspiring journey. Be sure to listen wherever you get your podcasts. We now return to Constant Wonder.